Dr. Hibagai, can you tell us about your background as a doctor? I've been a doctor for around 20 years and a GP for um, around 15 years. And I currently work at Northern Environmental Health Centre, which is in Whangarei. This is important to you, isn't it? Can you tell us why you want to speak out about 5G, Heather? What's become clear to me is there's a real inconsistency between the information we're getting from the media um, and what I'm reading in the published literature and hearing from international scientific experts in this field. And there's really no sensible dialogue about the potential harms of 5G. On the one hand, we have sponsored ads in the Herald saying, and I quote, around 25,000 studies have been conducted on the effects of mobile technology on humans, and none have found that radio waves used by 5G, 2G, 3G, and 4G would impact people's health. And on the other hand, we have multiple appeals and petitions signed by scientists and doctors who work in the field of biological effects of the electromagnetic fields, um, such as the 2015 EMF scientist appeal with over 240 signatures, which states, numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMF affects living organisms at levels well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being on, in humans. Damage goes well beyond the human race, as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to both plant and animal life. I believe in New Zealand, public have a right to more information about the effects of 5G on health, but most of the media uh, is not serious investigative journalism, but either trivialises or dismisses this issue. Yes, it's almost as if they're collaborating with the telecommunications companies, isn't it? Yes, and there does seem a clear conflict of interest there. Yeah. I would like to point out that there is one publication which includes articles about the health effects associated with microwave radiation. It's got articles about 5G, and that's the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine. Do you consider that radiation from cell phones and cell phone towers harms health? Yes, I definitely do. There's now a weight of evidence in the scientific literature about harm from microwave radiation. If you look at the peer-reviewed um, literature by independent scientists, those that are not sponsored by industry, then 70% of studies show evidence of biological harm. Unfortunately, industry have been sponsoring their own studies and their own scientists, and you end up with a clear bias. This is very much like what happened in the tobacco industry, where they managed to create confusion around the health harms, um, and it delayed public health um, changes by decades. Dr. Deborah Davis uh, documents in her book Disconnect some of the underhand tactics used by industry to muddy the waters and create um, confusion around this issue. Can you talk about some of the health effects of microwave radiation, please? The health effect that we have the most clear evidence for is the impact on sperm. This is seen in human studies uh, with um, cell phones in pockets, um, in animal studies, and in studies in lab conditions. And they all show the same thing. Sperm exposed to microwave radiation at low non-thermal or non-heating levels uh, show reduction in sperm count and sperm function. And some of the studies also show increased rates of DNA breaks, uh, which is significant because sperm uh, are unable to repair DNA. Another area of concern is in animal studies that show an opening of the blood-brain barrier after microwave exposure. So our blood-brain barrier is supposed to be impermeable and the studies show that a permeable blood-brain barrier can let uh, larger molecules through uh, that shouldn't be there. So we think that this is playing into the generation of chronic disease 
And one of the ways that this presents is in people who are electrosensitive or electrohypersensitive. And we don't really hear this term much in New Zealand. There's very little awareness of it. But in, in some areas, there is much more awareness, uh, such as Europe, uh, where the, both the public and doctors are much more aware, and around 3% of the population identify as being electrosensitive. The criteria for being electrosensitive is uh, developing symptoms uh, which reduce or go away in zones that are free of electrosmog. And these symptoms can be things such as fatigue, headache, insomnia, tinnitus, brain fog and palpitations. The current research suggests that the underlying causes are uh, both a opening of the blood-brain barrier, uh, as we mentioned previously, and also uh, a reduction in blood flow to some areas of the brain, particularly the thalamic and limbic areas of the brain. So this is really a significant public health issue as there are probably many people out there who are not aware that they are sensitive to electromagnetic fields and um, due to this there's a delay in, in recognition and some people can become quite unwell with this and are unable to work or unable to integrate into normal life because of the presence of electrosmog everywhere. Another issue is cancer. And the data here is not conclusive, but it is very worrying. In 2011, IARC, which is the uh, international organisation that looks at uh, cancer risk, labelled non-ionising radiation as a class 2b, which is a possible carcinogen. And since that time, there are two very important animal studies that have come out. One of these is the uh, 25 million uh, national toxicology program in the US, uh, which looked at um, mice and rats. Uh, and what that showed was a clear increase uh, in schwannomas of the heart, which is a tumour of the nerve uh, sheath of, of uh, those cells, um, and also an increase in the rate of uh, brain gliomas, which is a malignant brain tumour. And the human epidemiological studies uh, have expressed concern around the brain gliomas um, and the work um, from both the interferon study and that of Dr. Hardell's group and the meta-analysis that he's done suggests that in the heavy users, so that's uh, 30 minutes over 10 years, that there is a 40% or more increase in the risk of brain gliomas. And this is very concerning because we have to remember that these tumours uh, take a long time to develop. So we don't know what things are going to show in 10 or 20 years' time, but, but probably we're going to see significant increases over that period. And there is also a significant concern uh, in that young people are getting exposed um, to significant levels of microwave radiation. The brains of children absorb around about twice the amount of uh, radiation that human that uh, adults do, um, and there is some concern that we're going to see higher rates in children and young people that are currently being exposed uh, once they reach adulthood. Some countries, such as um, European countries, have strong recommendations not to use cell phones in emergency under the age of 16 years. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the current modern cell phones uh, have recommendations, unfortunately embedded deep within the phone, you've got to hunt for them, that suggest that you use your cell phone two centimetres away from the head because that's where they're tested. Um, but this is not what uh, current practice is. What do you think about the current exposure standards used by our government? Well, the levels of microwave exposure have, are estimated to have risen a thousand fold in the last 20 years. And the standards that we base our exposure on um, are about 20 years old. And these exposures are based on thermal effects. That is the amount of microwave exposure that is required to heat tissue. 
but clearly there are uh, effects well below these levels. The New Zealand government follows standards set by the uh, ICNIRP, which is an international body, uh, but there is concern that members of this board are heavily influenced by industry and that they haven't changed their exposure standards based on the current research. Um, there are many countries around the world that have exposure standards that are 10, 100, even a thousand times less than what the New Zealand standards are. But I also want to make it clear that, our, that the majority of our exposures are actually within the home. So that is Wi-Fi, cordless phones, cell phones, all the devices that hook up to these things, uh, tablets, uh, some printers, playstations, and so on. And so the, uh, the majority of our exposures are currently uh, within the home. Um, with the coming of, of 5G, uh, there is also the Internet of Things, which means that devices such as fridges and uh, possibly washing machines and so on will also be a missing uh, microwave radiation as well. One thing that really concerns me about uh, our exposure standards is that there is no protection for children and young people. And many countries have uh, taken the precaution of banning Wi-Fi from early childhood centres and schools. Um, and to me, this is really a no-brainer. Um, there are studies that link uh, Wi-Fi exposure uh, and cell phone exposure, uh, and this is both antenatal studies and exposure during childhood to a range of neurobehavioural issues. Uh, this includes things like hyperactivity and emotional difficulties. Um, and we really have no idea what the long-term effect of microwave exposure will be on this generation of children. So what do you think about the proposed rollout of 5G throughout New Zealand? It really makes no sense to me on any level. Uh, we already have uh, fibre cabling through most of the country and uh, hardwiring is, is a decent option in terms of getting the speeds that, that you need. Um, the, the other concern about 5G is that it's going on top of our existing exposures. So we're not going to be turning off 3G and 4G anytime soon. Um, the 5G will be an exposure on top of this. And another thing I don't think the public realises is that the cell phone towers will have to be spaced quite closely um, due to the change in frequency. So estimated about every 200 metres. So they will be outside homes, outside rooms. Um, and this is a real concern. Um, and we don't know the health effects of 5G. It has not been studied. Um, but, you know, it is a different technology from the, the current technologies. It's going into much higher frequencies, uh, into the, the millimetre wave um, length. Um, and there are significant concerns about things like uh, corneas of eyes, um, skin and skin cancers, um, bacteria on skin and uh, uh, bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Um, and as, as mentioned, once the Internet of Things comes in, uh, houses will have uh, increased exposure as well. What advice do you have for the viewers, please? Well, firstly, I suggest that you make your own home safe. And this is relatively easy to do. Even just reducing your nighttime exposure uh, by turning off your Wi-Fi and cordless phone and, and other devices, turning off, putting your cell phone on flight mode, um, that's really important because our brain regenerates at night and that's the most imp important time to get free of these exposures. Um, you can also hardwire by using Ethernet cables. You can change your cordless phone to a corded phone um, and you can turn all your devices off onto on flight mode when, when not in use. Um, cell phone use, as we mentioned previously, you know, hold it away from your body, um, have it on speaker when you're talking or use a headset, and also be aware that in any uh, metal box such as a car, the signals will be bouncing, so it's best to turn it onto flight mode when you're in a car or on a train. Um, and the most uh, important group that need to reduce their exposures are pregnant women, uh, children and young people, um, and anyone who has a chronic illness.
And I really encourage people to research this issue for themselves. A good place to start is the Bioinitiative Report, um, which is found at bioinitiative.org. And they have really good summaries of the research, as well as much more in-depth uh, analysis for people to dive into. Um, and just consider whether you want 5G for yourself and your families. At present, the rollout of 5G and this agenda is being pushed by industry, um, but we do have a voice and we should express what we think on this issue. And we really need to get a discussion going within the communities in New Zealand. Mm, talk to our friends and family. Exactly. Make, make them aware of the issues that the mainstream media has failed to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Heather. That's great. Thank you.